Hello and welcome to another Monash Matters. Last week, I mentioned my good friend, Professor Ian Brighthope, um, and some of the information that he'd been putting out to uh, the nation and the world on the issues that affect us all, especially COVID, COVID and all the related matters around that. Um, Professor Brighthope, thank you for joining us today. I'd love you to give, I know you well, but I'd love you to give a short introduction Introduction for our viewers to uh, uh, get to know you a little bit better. Thanks, Russell. Thanks for the privilege of talking to you and your your, um, your members and audience. Uh, I am um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share some of my knowledge. My back background uh, as a medical practitioner goes beyond being a medical practitioner. I trained in agricultural science, so I have an understanding of uh, foods and nutrition in animals and crops and pastures. But uh, during my medical training, I was disappointed that we didn't learn very much about human nutrition and how to make people healthy. So uh, after uh, a number of years, uh, in fact, it's now uh, 50 years since I graduated this year, uh, I started the College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine uh, and started training doctors in uh, the nutritional aspects of healthcare, both in the treatment of disease as well as the prevention of disease, um, in, including uh, things like heart disease, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cancers, stroke, uh, and of course, boosting up the immune system to improve uh, people's responses to uh, infections and uh, either treat infections or prevent infections, whether they be viral or bacterial. So it was, it's was it been a long journey for me. Uh, and I've learned a lot from uh, science. I've learned a lot from medicine, and the two are different. And I've learned a lot from uh, the social aspects uh, uh, of humanity and how important uh, socialization is in longevity and how important it is to be able to relate to one another um, kindly and with respect. Uh, and uh, to, in, in a difficult situation where it's very hard uh, retraining doctors who've learned all about uh, diagnosis, diseases, drugs and uh, surgery, uh, but it, it, they are in the woods when it comes to you know, looking after people's uh, health, uh, including the, the health of their mind, uh, the health of their bodies, physical health, uh, mental health and spiritual health. So uh, these are things that don't come into, uh, into medical practice. Um, so I've had my foot in both camps, which has been a great privilege and an honour, um, and learnt a lot. However, uh, when I was disappointed in medical school about the lack of nutrition, I'm equally disappointed now, Russell, with regard to the way <coughs> um, the last four years have been managed by uh, the health bureaucrats in this country. I, I uh, am very disappointed in the science that's been applied uh, in the management of uh, a very low risk virus. I mean, the, the COVID virus was only risky for those over the age of 75 to 80 and those with comorbidities, which means that, um, uh, two and a half uh, other sort of illnesses like a heart disease and lung disease or uh, kidney disease and liver disease or people on immunosuppressive drugs. Well, we didn't need um, lockdowns and I argued against this right from the beginning. I wrote to uh, the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, the Chief Medical Officer, um, the unions, business leaders, uh, the RACGP, the AMA uh, about in instituting or executing a vitamin D uh, a C and uh, zinc uh, campaign um, to boost up the immunity of the population so that all of us would end up with either uh, a flu-like illness, a mild cold, or no symptoms at all. Why uh, do you think they didn't take up the C, D and zinc campaign? Uh, I'm, I'm a great believer in C, D and zinc. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, well, we're, I, well, well, we're talking about vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. Yes. And I have found a product now where you can get all three in the one capsule. Yes, that's that's brilliant. Um, it's not hard it, to get. It's not hard to get. And uh, you probably will knock off all colds. And we, we know that the vitamin D at a certain level will prevent you getting flu. And it's more profound and, and longer lasting than the flu vaccines. I mean, you get a flu vaccine, you can be made sick or you can still end up getting the flu. Um, the, the, uh, so the, are, you saying, are you saying today that if, if, as you have described previously, that people's immune systems have been diminished by the RNMA vaccines, I'll, I'll call them vaccines, because the public call them vaccines. Sure, yeah. You know, we can say they're not vaccines and go into all that, but the fact is the public call them vaccines. 
if their immune system, the Australian immune system as a nation has been diminished, what can they do today to increase their um, strength against any virus? The, the, the best things to do generally are to get some exercise and sunlight. Uh, two things that we were denied uh, during lockdown. Um, you know, third world countries in Central America were coming out with advertisements to their people, go out, get some sunlight, change your diet, uh, get some exercise. And they were promoting this during COVID. Um, we were locking people up so we wouldn't get the sunlight. And the sunlight vitamin, vitamin D, is the most powerful substance you can use, not only to stimulate your immune system, but to prevent a number of cancers, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, and possibly even Alzheimer's disease. This is what sunlight does to us. I mean, we were meant to get sunlight. All living things are meant to get sunlight. Just because we're not a plant doesn't mean to say we don't need it. The, the, the sun on our skin, the ultraviolet on our skin, stimulates other things in our body as well, including hormones like melatonin uh, and vitamin B3 to actually improve our moods. So the, 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 the opposite was done to what should have been done at the beginning. And you ask me why I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the Prime Minister, Health Minister and Chief Medical Officer ignored me because they, uh, they I think, like most people, have been absolutely brainwashed that this was a, a severe virus that was going to kill so many people uh, and that the only answer was lockdowns and masks, social distancing and vaccines. Well, there's been absolutely, Russell, absolutely no evidence that lockdowns work. Absolutely no evidence that masks protected against a virus like this. Absolutely no evidence that all of these plastic shields stop viruses spreading around uh, cashiers and supermarkets. There is no evidence whatsoever that uh, this vaccine, this mRNA vaccine, was going to work from the start. The mRNA technology has never been shown to be effective in any serious uh, and common uh, human disease, either prevention of or treatment therapy. So that's a, big, that's a very big statement, Professor. It, it is, but uh, even even one of the inventors, Robert Malone, uh, admitted one of the inventors of mRNA admitted, even though he took the va vaccine, he said. Uh, I knew it was not going to work. Uh, and many experts now in immunology are saying there was no evidence that it was going to work. And in fact, the, the studies that we do, were done were very short-term studies. There was no proper control uh, to determine whether or not it would work or not. Uh, yet uh, it was called an emergency use authorization to give it to billions of people around the world. This to me is mass insanity. It's crazy. It's crazy science when we knew right from the start that vitamin D will protect you against coronaviruses, um, other respiratory viruses, and the influenza viruses. So why didn't we get the doctors to test everybody who may have a low level of vitamin D and boost their immunity by supplementing with vitamin D and getting to go out in the sunshine? This was, this was proper management. I mean, I've done a little bit of training in, in risk management uh, and, uh, and looking at issues like this. Uh, and I understand uh, how things come about. Epidemiologists look at populations and look at population risk. I look at individuals and individual risk. You know, I'm a clinician. Uh, when I see somebody who's had uh, the mRNA vaccine in his 70s, not wanting it, but receiving it, feeling ill that night and not waking up in the morning. That, to me, is a cause and effect of a drug. Now, we, we have been talking about delays in, uh, in science and investigation. We're not even looking at the number of people dying from the vaccine to determine exactly what they're dying from. We put down a diagnosis of a heart attack or cardiac arrest, for example. But I want to know what caused the blood to get so sticky to cause the heart attack or what caused the electricity in the heart to stop functioning and therefore the heart stopped pumping. I want to know what's going on from a, a pathological perspective, but there's no proper autopsies being done. It, people are just dying uh, and we don't know why. The success death rate between... I, mean, I, I actually talked about excess deaths 
a year, more than a year ago, an Australian excess death. So I wasn't, I wasn't talking about UK figures. I wasn't talking, I, in the parliament, I spoke on the issue in the parliament. I checked with you before I spoke on the issue in the parliament. And I talked about 17% increase at that time in Australian excess deaths. And that, that's a lot of lives, a lot of people. Um, and that only began um, in 21 and is continuing today. It's continuing today, Russell, and we're not only seeing uh, deaths directly from the vaccine, but we're seeing the effects of the vaccine on the immune system. So we are now seeing an increased incidence of difficult to manage type 1 diabetes in all ages. We are actually seeing an increase in autoimmune diseases across the board. We're seeing an increase in what's now being termed turbo cancers, and these turbo cancers are very difficult to manage. And we're seeing, of course, an increase, a massive increase in heart disease. Now, the, we know the vaccine causes myocarditis. So does the virus. It can cause myocarditis. But that's rare. And most people get over it. But this uh, vaccine is not just causing a, a viral-induced in, myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. So a virus can, a virus, yes, we'll get to it. A virus can cause heart problems. Yes, it can. But it's not common. It's not common. It usually occurs in somebody who's immunosuppressed or it can occur in somebody who's got deficiencies of certain nutrients that we've been talking about. Well, how common was myocarditis before uh, 2020? One in a thousand or one in 10,000 or less. The virally oh. induced, very, very low incidence. Very low incidence. Now we're seeing uh, in, in some uh, individuals, especially boys, we're seeing up to 40% of heart damage being occurring, and it's subtle in some. It's not no, necessarily an overt uh, inflammatory response in the heart. But if you have had heart damage, it's there for good. The heart never recovers. And this inflammation in the heart is not the typical inflammation like you get a sore throat from a virus and the inflammation is there and it goes away and the tonsils settle down. This inflammation actually causes the heart to, um, the, the immune system, flowing through the heart to produce antibodies to the heart muscle cells and probably also to the nervous system inside the heart. And these are the reasons we're seeing sudden deaths in young people, especially those who go out onto the field uh, and exercise with an inflamed heart that is not causing necessarily a lot of pain. And we see them collapsing and dying on the, on the sports field. And there is an increased incidence of that around the world. Um, and that's, so, that's because they put their bodies into extreme energy. Yes, it, it, it is. When you, uh, when you start to exercise uh, from the brain down, you start producing hormones. Uh, and hormones go to the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands start pumping out uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. And these are the fight and flight uh, type hormones of stress. And they both stimulate the heart to pump faster, harder. Uh, and therefore there is increased uh, electrical activity in the heart. And when that occurs in a, in a damaged heart, where there is autoimmune phenomena occurring, you get what we call um, a, a return of the, uh, of, the, of the circuitry. Instead of the, the, uh, the heart pumping smoothly, the electric circuit uh, goes astray. And it's like electric currents going everywhere. And then, in that case, the heart stops. And that's where Ian, you, you once walked the corridors of Canberra uh, with with all the previous ministers, and and they sought your advice. Um, so therefore, when you write a letter to Mark Dreyfus or the Prime Minister or the Health Minister, you would expect a an immediate response. Have you had immediate responses? No, I met uh, I met the Prime Minister, the uh, Scott Morrison. Mentioned his name because these are the people I know. Uh, I've met uh, Greg Hunt many times when he was environment minister and in office here in Victoria, uh, and he was very impressed with my CV. Uh, putting that aside, uh, we uh, we had a reasonably good relationship because I was uh, at one stage lobbying to uh, have greater access for patients who needed medicinal cannabis. So uh, during COVID, uh, I wrote to uh, uh, Greg um, 
I think it was March 2020 or April 2020. I've got all of the letters here. Uh, and I received no response uh, from him whatsoever. Uh, so I decided to, uh, because I was a supporter of the Liberal Party in uh, Tasmania, uh, uh, as a consequence of that, I was invited to a number of uh, private dinners, uh, private Zoom dinners or lunches with uh, a number of the ministers of the Morrison government. And one of them was Greg Hunt. Uh, and I, and uh, I had pleaded with him in my emails to uh, um, institute or execute a vitamin D campaign or program, uh, but there was no uh, no response. So I, I decided I'd get onto one of the Zoom dinners uh, 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 and speak to Greg. Um, but were these but, a fundraising dinner, were they? Yes, they were fundraising dinners. Yes, yeah, they were. Um, uh, the the one where he actually uh, responded to me in a positive way was one that was organised by Senator Erica Betts, who I've known and respected uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it's always been a, a great supporter of uh, natural health, and uh, he is a, uh, somebody who is, I think, highly trustworthy. Um, so Greg uh, said, look, I've... I understand your uh, enthusiasm for this, Ian. There's not really that much evidence I've been told about vitamin D, but look, I'll get you to uh, talk to uh, some of the experts. And he passed me on to uh, um, John Skerritt from the TGA, who I also know and have had dealings with and got on very well with. But uh, the evidence I sent them was, was just uh, went over their heads, I think, or his advisors, I think his medical advisors said, look, this is just sort of nonsense. Uh, don't take any notice of it. Now, when when I hear this sort of thing, I start examining what's going on uh, in my profession, uh, and it, it so happens that the doctors under the RACGP, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, have been advised that vitamin D testing is expensive and not necessary. So, therefore, they don't recommend it. I can't believe what a what are the symptoms of a lack of vitamin D? I want to stick with this one because I believe that my personal view is that um, uh, those that have taken two um, injections, if they're fine, they're going to be fine. If they're fine, they're going to be fine. It's only the boosters that seem to coming through as, as, as a problem. But I can't say that because I'm not a doctor. I can't tell anybody what to do. I don't tell anybody what to do. I just want to, the truth and the information to be out there through people like yourself who do have the expertise and who have been dealing with these issues. That's why you're on the program. Um, we make sure that we don't mislead anybody in any direction. And perhaps I, um, I have no right to say uh, the boosters are a problem because the government of the day today are saying to people, get your boosters. I, I can't believe that they're saying get your boosters uh, when the boosters are not necessarily aligned with the virus that's out there in, in the community. And the well, virus. What about, out a, what about a new virus? They're talking about virus X. I've heard it on a number of things. Um, I don't know whether virus X is actually out there now or it's not out there now. I believe there's another very strong strain of COVID going through Australia at the moment. There, there is a strong strain of COVID, uh, Russell, but the more vaccines you have, the more boosters you have, the more of an adverse effect it has on the functionality of your immune system because you're producing spike protein all the time, which is toxic, uh, and the immune system is overworked. Uh, in simple terms, if you're overworking the immune system, and for example, you've got low levels of vitamin A in your system, your killer cells are going to start failing. And, you know, these nutrients are absolutely critical to well-being. We should be giving people advice with regard to what they're eating. Uh, and if those who can't afford supplementation, um, uh, the government should be paying for some of these supplements for, for those who do need them. But, you know, if you wait to find out what the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency are, you'll end up with osteoporosis, fractured, fractured bones. So if you're not testing vitamin D, this is what happens. And, you know, this, this sort of thing from the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners is, is irresponsible, highly irresponsible. It is unscientific. 
and they have no evidence for saying what they're saying. And we have written to them. Uh, four medical organisations, um, I'll mention three of them, the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine, the National Institute of Integrative Medicine, and the Australian Integrative Medical Association, of which I'm a supporter, a member, uh, and one of them I actually founded 42 years ago. The, we wrote to the RACGP and they came back with a, a response that was completely oblivious to the, to the courts. Uh, they want to show the, us to show the wisdom of doing the testing. Uh, what are the what are, what are, what are the I mean the wisdom the wisdom is to look at the science and look at the facts and, and data and just decide and make a judgment about the evidence you get you've got and the evidence that you're ignoring uh, and we now know that the RACGP are conflicted and they they have uh, uh, funding directly or indirectly uh, from big farm uh, and they are blind to anything else apart from vaccines, antibiotics, and antivirals. Uh, and we know if we overuse antibiotics, antivirals, vaccines, we end up with immune problems. And we also end up with superbugs. We have to be able to fight these bugs ourselves, Russell. Uh, and those who've got comorbidities, like heart disease or lung disease, they, know, they need extra care to boost yep. up their they, they need extra advice. Look, let me tell you, you can, if you just reduce your sugar and alcohol intake uh, and reduce your, in, your uh, stress levels, you will see massive improvements in your immune system. You go out into the sunshine and do some exercise, you see improvements in your immune system, and these things are measurable. They are measurable. We need to, we need to believe what we really think we are, and that is... We think we're a sporting nature, nation. We think we're healthy and fit, but we're giving the wrong advice when we're giving medical advice only for a preventable disease. Yeah. And so exercise, exercise, vitamin C, D and zinc. Um, you said it brightens the heart if you have vitamin B3, obviously. It changes the mood. Yes. So um, can I ask you a, a, a professional question? Uh, is there any way you would overdose on vitamin C, D or zinc? You can overdose on everything, including water. Uh, but the doses that we've been recommending for vitamin C, D and zinc are not overdosing. I mean, 4,000 units of vitamin D, I can go out in the sunshine and get 20,000 units. That's 20 capsules if I stay out long enough uh, without getting burnt. Um, you can uh, overdose with zinc. Uh, and as soon as you do, you start uh, feeling a little bit nauseated. But that's much higher than the doses that we're recommending. I mean, we, we talk about four or 5,000 units of vitamin D. If somebody comes to me in, in a hospital situation, and is in the past, and I was practising, if you're deficient in vitamin D, we can give you 300,000 units or even 600,000 units by injection. That's 600 of those capsules in the... Um, and that will bring the levels up. In fact, in Spain, they were giving vitamin D, active vitamin D, to patients with COVID and stopping them from getting sick and going from water to intensive care. Incredible. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. Um, in, in fact, uh, in the Western countries where the vaccines were most prominent, the treatment was quite different to places like India. Very different. Um, if you would like me to mention what happened in India, uh, the India, Mexico, uh, my colleagues in India and Africa were, were prescribing an anti-parasitic medication called ivermectin uh, for their uh, populations and their patients. And in these areas, that people stopped getting sick from COVID. Uh, they stopped, they reduced the hospitalizations and they reduced the deaths of those who were susceptible to COVID death. Um, which, with, with ivermectin in the early stages of the, uh, of the disease. Uh, it cost practically nothing. It cost practically nothing, a few and cents. it was an award-winning medicine, I think, Nobel yeah. Peace Prize, Nobel Prize for medicine. 
the uh, the Japanese uh, inventor won the Nobel Prize. Uh, Nobel Prize, I think, in medicine or physiology, but certainly uh, it was at that uh, at the height of uh, um, scientific discovery, and it was not used for um, anything at the time apart from treating and preventing river blindness and elephantitis uh, in Africa. River blindness and elephantitis are caused by parasites. Uh, and by accident, it was discovered that ivermectin uh, in the test tube at Monash University uh, suppressed the COVID virus. So the doctors in the US started trialing it and using it. Uh, and we know it, there's so many studies to support this antiparasitic drug, which was badly uh, treated by the mainstream media uh, called horse paste, which uh, I think those who ever called it horse paste uh, should hang their heads in shame because uh, probably helped to uh, kill. No, they accused me of taking horse paste. <laughs> but, well, um, you know, I've, I've spilled enough ivermectin on myself over the years that, um, uh, uh, or oh, it's called ivermectin cattle, for, for drenching yeah. cattle. Um, and you don't, you try not to spill it on you, but of course you're going to get it spilled on you and it goes straight through your skin. Um, that's the, the way it's done with the cattle. Um, so uh, I don't know, and I, I didn't, I suffered no ill consequences from that. Um, well, Russell, uh, let me just say that uh, you probably helped yourself a lot because that we're now suffering that it has uh, some profound anti cancer properties as well. So my colleagues <clears throat> overseas are using it actually to treat uh, help as part of a, a polypharmacy program to, to treat cancer patients. So, um, yeah, it's it's an incredibly valuable medicine. And it was derived from a, a fungus in the soil of Japan, uh, just as um, penicillin was derived from a, a yeast-like organism growing on orange peel. So uh, we uh, we derive things from nature that are most profound and effective. Um, and you, if, if we're going to play with nature, we, we play very gently with nature because if we don't obey her, uh, we suffer. Um, somebody once said we can nature only by obeying her. And I think uh, we, we need to take that maxim on board uh, as something that's very serious for uh, the future of humanity. Ian, I know there's lots of subjects we haven't uh, come to today. I'd love you to come back on in a few weeks' time when you get the response from Mark Dreyfus. Uh, sure. Otherwise, I will raise it with Mark Dreyfus um, that he hasn't responded when the Parliament resumes in three weeks' time. Um, and I look forward to that. Um, I hope there is a flood of truth in 2024 uh, that will vindicate all you and your colleagues have been saying and that they will be listening to you very carefully. So I'd like, really like to thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Russell. I'd like to thank you too for your uh, uh, very, very powerful efforts in uh, trying to get the truth out uh, to your colleagues and to your uh, people in your electorate. Uh, take you. my hat if you really do. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.